I want to uh, offer a warm welcome to everyone, friends, visitors, members, and those who are may be watching via internet this morning. We pray that you will have a, uh, a blessing. Uh, today, we want to talk about the fact that nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. You know, we live in a busy world, and it's easy to get tied up in the things that we do, the things that we need to do, and it's easy, easy to be distracted and to forget a worship of God. But I'm glad that we have a God who is unchangeable. He's always there when we need him. And we also, but on the other, on the other side of the coin, we have an enemy that is unchangeable. And he is, he is relentless. We're gonna talk about that today. We have a relentless enemy. And it's easy to forget that we have one as we go about from day to day. And you know, that enemy, his name is Satan. He, he was created an archangel. He was the magnificent one. And we'll read about that. But he is one who is desirous of being ahead of God, on top of God. In fact, he desires your worship. He desires my worship. And the sad fact is that when we neglect a worship of God, we're worshiping the enemy. So let's connect a few dots here. I'm not going to give you text that you're unfamiliar with. All these passages you're familiar with, we want, but we want to connect a few dots this morning. Uh, we'd like to see uh, if we can maintain some perspective, connect a few dots and see where, if we can uh, highlight and bring forward the unchangeableness of the enemy. Before we do that, let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you give us a chance to look in your word, to see who you are. We're thankful of your warnings that you've given to us. We're thankful for the blessings that you promise us. Be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn with me to Genesis, the second chapter, and verse, start out with verse 15. Again, these are not unfamiliar passages. This is our, well, we'll read what God told Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.15. It says, the Lord took, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, this is what he said now, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, because God is our creator, the owner of all things, it's his prerogative to give those kind of instructions. It's his prerogative to lay down that type of uh, uh, situation where Adam and Eve had access to every tree in the garden except the one in the middle. And that was a problem. The enemy of souls was there also. He had been thrown down to the earth. He was in the middle of the garden. In fact, he was on that tree. And we first encounter him in chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made, the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, God hadn't said that. He said you could eat all of, of all the trees except one. 
the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat of the tree from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent told the woman. For God knows that when you eat, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. We see right away, early in Bible uh, history, the nature of the enemy. The enemy contradicts God. He's called, in the New Testament, he's called the father of what? He is called the father of lies. He was the father of lies in the beginning. He was the father of lies in Jesus' time. And he's the father of lies today. We have to remember that, that he is the father of lies. He wasn't always a father of lies. In fact, if you would turn with me to Isaiah, the 14th chapter, we won't read the entire passage, but we will read the 14th verse of the 14th chapter of Isaiah to paint a little picture of what Satan or Lucifer was like. It says there in the 14th verse, things that Satan aspired to do. He said, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. It was his, from the time that he got all these ideas in his head, it was his desire to usurp God to be higher than God, to receive from people, from angels, the worship that only God should receive. In fact, in Ezekiel, if you turn with me, if you would, Ezekiel chapter 28, and verse 12, we have a, a little story, a little uh, picture of what Satan was like before he became Satan, while he was still that co uh, covering cherub. It says there in verse 12 of Isaiah, uh, excuse me, of Ezekiel, excuse me, I, yeah, Ezekiel 28 and chapter 12, uh, verse 12. Oh, we'll start with, excuse me, we'll start with verse 14. It says, you were an anointed as the God, you were anointed as the guardian cherub. This is speaking of, uh, of Satan, of Lucifer. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. Now listen to this. This is speaking of Satan before he fell. It says, you were blameless. You were blameless in your ways, from the day you were created. Satan was a created being. Lucifer was a created being. Until wickedness was found in you, through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you, God said, in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. We're told, and this is not news to us as Bible students, that the individual that we call Satan right now, the enemy of souls, is once blameless, he was one that was given a special job. He was near God. But the one thing that God did not and could not do was bring him 
in the close circle that he had with his son, Jesus. And especially he neglected to bring Satan in on creation, this type of activity, which only God could do. Satan, or Lucifer at the time, was a wonderful person, uh, angel. He was blameless, the Bible says. He was physically strong. In fact, one writer says that he could sing in eight, was it eight octaves or eight uh, parts uh, thereabouts. So he had a wonderful melodious voice, according to one uh, writer. And he, he was quite an individual, but he wanted the worship that is due only God. And folks, he has not changed. He wanted that type of worship then. He wants that type of worship today. Is it any secret that key to the last message that is presented to this world found in Revelation 14 concerns worship, concerns worship. Because the, the, the question of worship will be a question that is with us until time ends. Because the enemy wants it. God says, no, you should only worship me. The enemy says, no, I will put my throne above the stars of God. The enemy wants your worship. He wants my worship. The enemy has not changed. And unfortunately, his army among us, and he's got a lot of folks that walk this earth that are, and a lot of them don't even know it, but they're walking under the banner of Satan. And let me interject again, that if, it, if you are not consciously worshiping God, who do you think you're worshiping? There's only two choices. We're really either worshiping God or we're not worshiping God. We're worshiping God or we're worshiping Satan, as he would have it. And that's not going to change. And those who represent him, who, are, who walk under his banner, knowingly or unknowingly, will never change. Let's read just for a moment <clears throat> what the Bible says about that. Back in the Old Testament times, when the enemies of Israel, in this case Babylon, the enemies of Israel, who reflect, by the way, the character of Satan, the enemies of Israel at that time, Babylon, listen to what the Bible says about Babylon. It's in Jeremiah, the 51st chapter, and verse 9. And by the way, you would be well served to, know, to read uh, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51, Isaiah 47, the whole chapters. Now, there are other places, but these are three that, that are particular, and it describes the downfall of physical Babylon. Just as physical Babylon fell in that time, spiritual Babylon today is going to fall. Spiritual Babylon will fall, and as described by, uh, as physical Babylon is, is described, so physical, uh, spiritual Babylon will fall. But listen, listen to what God says about physical Babylon. I'm getting mixed up. Physical Babylon. Verse 9 of chapter 51. It says, we would have healed Babylon, but she cannot be healed. Let us leave her and each go to his own land for her judgment, that is Babylon's judgment, reaches to the skies. It rises as high as the clouds. And just a brief text points out the fact that nothing has changed. At the time, there was a physical Babylon, which we know today as Iraq. Satan had not changed. 
His army, we'll call it for want of better terms, Babylon, had not changed, could not change. The same today, those who walk under his banner have not changed. And we're called, actually, as a church, as Christians, we're called to come out of Babylon. So it's good that we come out of a system that cannot change. Turn with me, if you would. We're going to connect a couple more dots here. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 8. This describes part of uh, the, the temptation of Jesus where he was in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights, hadn't eaten. And Satan gave him three temptations, but let's listen to one of them. We're, we're talking about Satan who does not change. Again, the devil, that is Satan, took Jesus, or took him, Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And from a distance, I guess things look pretty good. The closer you get, the worse things look. So he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, verse 9, this depicts the unchanging nature and the desire of the enemy for worship. Satan said to Jesus, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Brothers and sisters, nothing's changed. It was, it was, and it is Satan's desire for worship. He hasn't changed. He will not change. We have to be aware that he is relentless. He is after you and me. And why do you think we're here on the Sabbath day? We're here to remember that God is who he said he is. We're here to remember that he is the creator God. We're here to remember that he led a people out of Egypt into a promised land. And he will lead his last day people out of Egypt, we'll put Egypt in quotes, into a promised land, that is, into a heavenly kingdom. So that's why we're here today, to remember that God is God. Satan wants to obliterate that. That this is why these pews are not filled. These pews should be filled this morning. These pews should be filled with folks offering worship to the God of heaven. Amen. I just pray that someday when I come here, if you ask me to preach again, that I'll come here and there won't be an, there, there won't be an empty seat. Amen. That this place will be filled to the brim. That we'll have folding chairs in the aisle. Amen. This is the way it should be. Because the enemy has done it. Why, why do you think the enemy set up a day of worship different from God? Why do you think so? It was his intention to direct people's focus away from God. And this is why we have most Christians, in fact, uh, in the world today, worship God on a day that he did not hallow. And I, I, I don't say that despairingly or disparagingly. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, it says that God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Didn't say he did that to the first day. He did that to the seventh day. He wants to remind us. And he knew that we should be reminded on a weekly basis that he is God that he deserves 
He demands and he deserves our worship. If we're not worshiping him, who are we worshiping? I'll leave that to you to describe, uh, to answer. Satan hasn't changed. His army hasn't changed. In fact, if you want to turn with me, if you would, to Revelation, the 13th chapter. Now we're getting down to the end of time. This is our time. This is our time. Revelation 13 and verse 15. It says, he was given power to give to the image of the first beast, to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that it could speak and to cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced, this is part of his character, he also forced everyone Small, and we, we can't get into all of this. This is a study of itself, but I just wanted to read this in context with the fact that nothing's changed. And he forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that, listen to this, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. The enemy of souls still demands worship, will demand worship. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Folks, it's a great struggle that we're in. The enemy of, uh, of souls wants our worship. He wants our praise. The God of heaven deserves our praise, deserves our worship. The God of heaven does not force. Jesus says, follow me. He didn't say, okay, I'm gonna whip you in line here. He says, follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. The enemy of souls forces people to do it his way. It's either his way or the highway. And at the end time, it's going to be his way or no way. Nothing's changed. This is why I believe we find in the 14th chapter of Revelation messages given to us. The Bible says they were three angels. You and I, folks, can be messengers of the same, giving the same message today. It's not a message against anybody. It's a message for God, a message that will be a salvific message to people. Let me read that. At least the first message I'll read to you, it starts out in verse 6. In fact, it was read as a scripture today. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel. The message is what? The eternal what? Gospel. This is the good news. It has the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth. Well, just a couple people, just one country, two countries. Bible says to every nation. This isn't a Western message. It isn't a South American message. It's a message for the whole world. It's not an African message. It's not an Asian message. It's a worldwide message. It says to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now listen to the worship part of this. He said in a loud voice, this is the angel, fear God, and respect God, and yes, 
It's good to, to have a little fear of God and give him glory. Give him glory. Worship him. Because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him, the, the message says. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of waters. Is it a mystery to us? Is it a mystery to you? At integral to the final message that is to be proclaimed to the earth, to every nation, kindred, tribe, and people. Is it a mystery that it should involve worship? Why does it need to be so? What's the big deal? Well, we have seen just briefly, and we could expand on it, but we have seen just briefly that the enemy of souls desires worship. And that if we're not worshiping God, brothers and sisters, by default, we're worshiping him. We're worshiping Satan. We may not think of it that way. It may not even cross our minds that we're doing such. But in the end, there's only two choices. God or the enemy. I want to be on the right side when the time comes. I want to be a child of Abraham, an heir, according, like we were reading in our lesson, the Bible study lesson, an heir according to the promise. Huh? I want to be a child of promise. How about you? Amen. I want to be a child of promise today. I want to be an heir. I want to inherit that which God would have me to inherit. So this message, this message of three angels, is a message of hope. Warning, yes. But above all, it's a message of hope. It's a reminder that the enemy of souls has not changed. Until the end of time, he will be desirous of your worship. He will put in front of you, he will put in front of me, a veritable a plethora of things to distract me. If I'm distracted from the worship of God, he's done his job. We have to be careful, especially in this day of gadgets. This is a, a, an age of gadgetry. I see, you know, my wife and I have a cell phone. Praise God, it's only basically for emergencies. We use it. But I am not one that likes to, or well, not likes to, I am not one that wants to watch my shows or whatever at the push of a button and, and as I'm going, hey, I'm not, I don't have my, new, my nose glued to a gadget. I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying they can be distracting. We can spend more time with gadgets than we can with the word of God. I encourage you this morning that you've again been reminded of the purpose of our enemy, Satan, who distract us and to entice us into worship of him, that you'll be on your guard, that you will spend time with your Lord. You will spend time with your Savior, Jesus Christ. That you will, through the influence of the Holy Spirit, allow him to change you and allow you to worship him. That's my prayer for you this morning. Amen. Amen.